Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass. Thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions, your premier platform for real-time global insights. We're going to take a look back at the last week here of total accumulated precipitation. And across much of the country, the major modeling centers, the European and the GFS, overall did a pretty good job on this. But there are some exceptions, specifically in parts of Northern California. This particular area had been forecast to pick up quite a bit of precipitation. But the timing between the deeper cutoff low that was just sitting offshore plus the trough that was sweeping through the Gulf of Alaska, well, the, the timing plus the separation of those two events prevented Northern California from getting the rainfall that we wanted. But as the front did sweep through parts of the Northern Plains, getting into this section of, of uh, the Midwest and the Corn Belt here, that was well forecast rainfall there from those thunderstorms. And then, of course, the dryness that surrounded that, plus the incredibly heavy rainfall from uh, Hurricane Delta as it cut through parts of Louisiana, then in through parts of Mississippi, uh, uh, Arkansas, then eventually over the weekend, and spreading heavy rainfall throughout much of the southeast of the Tennessee Valley and over toward the Appalachian Mountains also was pretty well forecast by our global models. So thinking about that, I would like to show you a zoomed in map here of the total accumulated precipitation uh, from uh, Hurricane Delta. And we're going to look down here right over uh, parts of the Mississippi Delta in the lower Mississippi River Valley. I did make a slight adjustment to my color bar for this image, and that was just so I could show you some of the heaviest amounts that went through parts of Louisiana, where as you can see there, between 6 and 15 inches of rainfall. Uh, did come out of this system. So very, very heavy rainfall. Remember, this was a place that was hit by uh, Tropical Storm Beta. It was also hit very hard uh, by Hurricane Laura. But Hurricane Laura, remember, that was well over a month ago back at the end of August. Are we watching anything important right now coming out of the um, main development region for, for hurricanes? National Hurricane Center has given this about a 30% chance of developing. And we look here in the background at what the European model is suggesting that that low pressure center does over the next week. And while it's right now limited by wind shear, we're going to keep just an eye on it as it moves over toward the Lesser Antilles and eventually north of them. We'll see if the wind shear does knock uh, this one out and keep it out to open ocean which is uh, good overall that we're not seeing any new tropical cyclogenesis here in the Caribbean or the Gulf of Mexico. But as we look out toward the end of the month, something I want to bring to your attention, the MJO. The MJO for the last month has been stuck over here in phase four and phase five, just weekly out of null phase. It is forecast to move, though, as you can see here, the latest European model is wanting to keep it moving on around here from phase five over to phase six and seven. So what that means is we're going to watch a transition in the tropics such that while right now sitting over the top of the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico, we do have quite a bit of upper level suppression. I want to keep a close eye out here for the time period of like the 19th through the 26th because during that time period if the MJO does start to move we could allow for better upper level support in that region. And what I mean here is this just takes kind of the lid off in the upper levels of the atmosphere for poss possible tropical cyclone development as we work our way to the end of the month of October. We'll also talk about what this might mean for South America at the end of this video. In the overnight hours, though, we did see storms pop up right here on the border between uh, Minnesota, North and South Dakota, and the storms did build down a line that went through parts of western Iowa and into eastern Nebraska. But by the time we got to early morning, the storms were starting to fizzle out a bit there as they were moving toward, you know, the Wisconsin, Iowa, and also the Illinois, Iowa border. What was interesting was that when you look at this on radar, uh, you can see we're really watching three different areas across the United States. We have what's left of Delta moving here through parts, you know, uh, of the mid-Atlantic. And this is going to spread some heavy rain here and some very strong offshore winds. We then have the next system that's cutting through the Pacific Northwest, bringing in some rain here, but really hitting the Cascades and the Rockies. But if we come back to our system here, cutting through the midsection of the country, why this didn't build on down the land, I'd like to show you that here in just a few moments, because this frontal boundary extends all the way down into Texas and New Mexico. Really quickly, the Fort Polk radar is having some problems this morning. That's why you see this. None of this is actually real echo from precipitation. But take a look at this animation. I grabbed this early this morning just to show you how dry things are in the southern plains. As we let this play forward, I'm going to pause it right there. You see the frontal boundary as it was cutting through parts of Minnesota, Wisconsin, certainly initiating showers and storms in this area, which we just saw. But look at the front. Look, it's all the way down here, plowing through parts of the southern plains. You can see this weak, narrow band on radar here, but not bringing in any of the precipitation. And uh, by the way, just the, the bright flecks you see down here, that's actually uh, echoes from wind turbines. That's what you're seeing. But one of the things to pay attention to here as that cut through was that 
But over the last 30 days, that's been an area that's been extremely dry. The southern plains of the United States, there are places there that have not seen rainfall in the last 30 days. And that's what this map shows. Now, clearly, your eyes are probably drawn to what's gone here with beta coming through like this. Now, of course, delta coming through like that and spreading into the northeast. And this is Sally. You know, what's not included on this is Laura, which also cut through this same exact area. So while the southeast and the lower Mississippi River Valley have been extremely wet, it's really only been there in parts of the Great Lakes. And then in the Pacific Northwest, that's also seen some above average precipitation. Much of the rest of the country has been quite dry over the last month. And if we do that same analysis, but instead look at soil moisture, this is just the top four inches looking at percentile. And we can see where it is extremely wet here. Also, just to the east of the, um, you know, the Red River of the North, getting into that part of Minnesota, and also parts of the Pacific Northwest, where we've lately brought in some heavier rainfall. But several places here, from the Four Corner States through much of the plains, getting over to the Corn Belt, we do have very low soil moisture content in the top four inches of the soil. Now, speaking of that, throughout the day today, the frontal boundary, which is connected to this low clear up here in this part of Canada, will stretch here, moving through parts of Illinois, Wisconsin, over toward Indiana, Michigan, and Ohio. The tail end of it does cut through parts of the lower and mid-Mississippi River Valley. But there's a large area of higher atmospheric pressure on the back side of this. And that flow coming around it here is, well, it's going to be quite windy in the high plains. And the air that's going to be there is very, very dry. And the fire threat through this area is elevated because of that. Before I show you how dry that air is, though, look at the winds right here in this part of the mid-Atlantic coming into like Delaware, Maryland, and parts of Virginia, then eventually getting up to New Jersey. That's an area we need to be very careful today if you are along that shore. But coming back to the midsection of the United States, we can see here that the humidity levels behind that frontal boundary will be in the teens to single digits. So very dry conditions here on strong winds. This whole region needs to be on the lookout here for fast spreading fires uh, like grass fires in this particular region. From there, let me take you back a year ago. It was kind of crazy, but I was showing you this map a year ago right now. And uh, this was uh, something we haven't seen in a while, these colors, right? Hard freezes, you know, the pinks here representing uh, winter storm warnings. And that was because we were concerned about a deep low that was going to be cutting through the northern plains, dropping anywhere between 8 and 28 inches of snow in parts of North and South Dakota. We did get that. Parts of North Dakota picking up 18 inches of snow a year ago right now. And thankfully, we're not talking about snow like that this year. And this was a much different growing season. But take a look at how September ended a year ago. What a difference a year makes, right? The southeast was extremely dry last year. It was the northern tier states that were extremely wet. And uh, what we see here is that the pattern difference between a year ago and now was substantial. And uh, we're going to pick up on some of the reasons for that as we finish up this particular video. Well, what are we watching for? Well, I hate to say it. There is, there are some chances for snow that we need to be discussing because this pattern is going to get quite blocked up. We're looking here at troughs and ridges staring right down on the North Pole. And as I play this forward, I want you to see the features that I'm getting concerned about. We do have some upstream blocking that's going to be uh, taking place right in this area. So it starts here in the Gulf of Alaska. It goes here toward um, the, the North Pole and then the downstream blocking here in the North Atlantic. So this ridging that we see right here cutting over the North Pole uh, is what's going to really keep the trough that's in the midsection of the United States and Canada from going anywhere. Take you all the way out to Saturday night here and we just see it really set up. So with all of these um, these very highly amplified ridges and the troughs that are stuck on either side of them. This is just too much of a meridional pattern. It means moving too much north-south rather than west-east to kick this out. So as I go through the weekend into early next week, our concern will be watching troughs, little shortwaves, I should say, cutting around this deeper trough, increasing our precipitation chances uh, here across the border of U.S. of the U.S. Uh, and Canada. And, uh, and also what the cooler weather is going to be like because of this. Because taking all that to day 10, that trough is still in place. And there is both upstream and downstream ridging that's going to keep this pattern from really moving too much. So over the next week, European model here picking up on total accumulated precipitation. Notice how dry we are from California through the four corner states into the central and southern plains. We are also dry extending through parts of like the Cotton Belt down into parts of the southeast. Storm track is going to prefer cutting into the Pacific Northwest first. And there's going to be quite a few low pressure systems 
clipping right here along the U.S.-Canada border. European models a bit more aggressive on the rainfall here in parts of the northeast compared to now what you're going to see, which is the GFS, but uh, still quite wet in this area. Overall, the models are in pretty good agreement through the next five days here on total accumulated precipitation. So let's take a look at some of the details here from the European. As I get this plane for you here, what we're going to watch first is where the remnants of Delta go. So early this morning, the heavy rainfall moving from parts of North Carolina, Virginia, up into the mid-Atlantic here. And then we do see our frontal boundary right here, kind of finally pulling throughout to the day today into Wisconsin, Illinois, and Indiana, such that by this evening it's moved here uh, almost to the Indiana and Ohio border. Now, as that happens, high pressure builds in behind this, and you saw the dry conditions with that. As we move forward now going into Tuesday morning, the frontal boundary that was kicking through the Midwest is now pulling into the Northeast, and there's going to be some enhanced chances of showers into parts of the Northeast as what's left from Delta interacts with that frontal boundary. Meanwhile, our next system pulls into the Pacific Northwest, as you can see there, very strong winds with this system coming into parts of Washington and Oregon with some snow at higher elevation here on the northern side of this. Meanwhile, higher atmospheric pressure pulls into the central United States out ahead of this next wave that comes through here. So from this point forward, which is Tuesday evening, let's now work our way to Wednesday morning, Wednesday afternoon and evening. And what we see is our first low clipping here along the U.S.-Canada border. So bringing our chances of precipitation up from Montana, the Dakotas, then eventually over into parts of Minnesota, Wisconsin. And you notice how tightly spaced these isobars are. It's going to be a very windy week midweek. But after this frontal boundary on, look at this, this is now, let me take you to Thursday morning. Here it is. This low that's sitting here over the Great Lakes states, there's a cold front stretch right down here to this secondary low that's going to be starved for moisture over the Red River Valley. What's going to happen is behind this, there's going to be some chances for some light rain on Thursday here, but a major change in temperature as this uh, comes in here toward the end of this week. So this is Thursday afternoon and evening. Now working away into Friday morning. With the big high pressure cell that's moving in here, much colder temperatures on the back side of this. I'll show you in just a few moments. And now as we work our way into the weekend, I'm going to have to start talking about the blue colors that show up on this map. Scattered snow showers uh, Friday afternoon and evening around northern Minnesota, northern Wisconsin, getting to the Great Lakes. Then you see coming out of parts of Alberta into Saskatchewan and Manitoba, chances for snow. And maybe some of that clips down here with the next little low into parts of North Dakota. As I let this go out into next week, what we're going to see on Sunday, chances of snow flying here early in the morning and parts of well, Montana getting into the Dakotas. And what I want to do is when I think about seeing that snow, this is kind of a tricky time to forecast it, but I'm at least going to show you this map. This is the probability, according to the European model, of grabbing an inch of snow uh, by the time we get all the way out to early next week. And at this point, it's really going to be confined to the higher country and parts of Montana, but just don't be surprised if you're in parts of the rest of Montana getting over to North South Dakota and, of course, northern Minnesota and Wisconsin to see a few snowflakes there. And the farther north you go to Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Quebec, and Ontario, uh, you can see better chances of picking up some snow in that region as well. Day 10. Take a look at the differences here between the GFS and the European. You can see the GFS on the, the left here bringing the main trough in through, well, basically stretching from Hudson Bay through the Great Lakes. The Europeans, it was a bit more slower with this pattern, and the main trough axis now sits back here and has that kind of tilt on it. So that means the flow is doing something like this in the European, and in the GFS, it's doing more like that. Now, why explain that? Well, the difference tells you what to expect in the week two precipitation. The GFS is much drier in the central United States with that trough much farther to the east, keeping this region wet. But with the European, remember keeping that trough more angled like this, we do open up that wave, bringing in better chances for rainfall that stretch from parts of maybe Texas and Oklahoma up through parts of Missouri, Illinois, and eventually into Michigan. So we're going to watch this pattern evolve to see which model did get this right uh, as we work our way through this week. All right, from there, let's talk temperatures. Behind that front, we are seeing temperatures 10 to 30 degrees cooler than they were yesterday at this time, but still quite warm out ahead of it. Take a look at how these temperatures change, though. Remember, we're watching the end of this week for a pretty substantial change. Remember, the numbers tell you the high temperatures. The colors tell you the departure from normal. So going from today, Monday, into Tuesday, watch that again with me. Ready? We don't see much of a change. But as we go from Tuesday into Wednesday, out ahead of that frontal boundary, look at the warm-up that we're going to be seeing down here in the southern plains. Another warm day compared to normal also in California. 
As we go from Wednesday to Thursday, though, this is where the big change begins. That frontal boundary pulls through quickly here. And when all of a sudden we start to see our high temperature struggling to get into the 50s in the midsection of the country. Friday is much the same as the front advances farther to the east. And here's Saturday, and we can get out to Sunday. Remember, it's at this point that the trough is now firmly established. We're going to see multiple rounds of cooler weather coming into the midsection of the United States and working their way east, while the rest, west excuse me, goes back up to warmer than average conditions. To show you a couple of nights I'm concerned about, here's uh, early Friday morning. Uh, you can see the extent of the frost as that white line there. So we're going to be watching uh, for some very cold temperatures here. As we go from Friday into Saturday, that's going to shift a bit east, really occupying much of the Great Lakes states in the Midwest here. So going to be getting some early morning low temperatures here that are going to be below that 32 degree threshold. From there, let's go out to the 6 to 10 day time period. Models were still looking pretty similar in the 6 to 10 day. And you can see here temperature stretching from the Canadian prairies through the central plains of the United States and over toward the Midwest. We're talking temperatures that could be as much as is 10 to 12 degrees cooler than average at times. But as we go out to the day 11 through 15, remember the GFS much more aggressive, bringing that trough farther to the east sooner. And that's why you see the uh, cooler weather there. Whereas the European letting it linger back farther, then we keep the cooler air right here over the plains of North America. So since we're talking about temperatures, let me finish up with a couple of ideas here. I'm going to be watching temperatures in the Arctic very carefully. Right now, we know that sea ice extent in the Arctic is currently sitting almost at the 2012 record low levels. And the area that I'm going to be watching most carefully is right in through here and also coming out of the Chukchi Sea into the Bering Sea. And why I'm watching that is because the interplay between the heat exchange and the lower atmosphere in the open ocean versus the ice, and then getting up toward the stratosphere is going to tell me what might possibly happen with the Arctic Oscillation, more commonly referred to as the polar vortex, as we work into our cold season. If it weakens it and displaces it, that's going to give us a lot of opportunity for seeing some major snaps of cold weather throughout much of North America. Looking on the other side of the planet, though, Eurasian snow cover during the month of September was well below average. Now, snow cover through the month of October in Eurasia, which again is here, is critical for setting up what the jet stream pattern could look like later on in the year. And I'll explain that more in my long range update on Wednesday. But you can see we are in deficit in parts of Siberia with snow so far through the month of October. From there, the other place I'm going to be watching closely for temperatures is going to be our La Nina region. We've now gotten our ocean temperatures in Nina region 3.4, which is again right in through here, down below 1 degree Celsius. And those trade winds are cranking, which means they're strong out of the east, allowing for a great upwelling, and which is going to continue to keep this La Nina going. Now, where this is having an effect right now, I think, is what's going on in South America. I just want to point out that over the next week, if you look at some of Brazil's northern growing areas right in through here, uh, the chances in the European model of picking up substantial rainfall to get the planting progress back on track is looking pretty low. It's much heavier rain as you get outside of that farther to the south. Maybe it's easier to see this if I compare it to normal. So over the next week, we do see there's a large pocket in through here where things are drier than normal, where it's going to be wet just to the south of that. All right. From there, I would like to show you now the week two forecast. And while we again see the wetter conditions in through here and also into Argentina, it's going to be this area that's going to have to pick up the pace with planting of the soybeans. But again, this also extends down here through Mato Grosso do Sol, Parana, Santa Catarina, and down into Rio Grande do Sol. So we're going to watch Brazil very carefully, knowing that they're having a lot of difficulty getting this soybean crop going early. And that's, of course, a major factor here around the globe with soybean production. So we'll keep a close eye on it, keep you updated. Hope you all have a great week. Thank you.